Good evening, everybody. Um, uh, thank you, Matt, for singing those words. I mean, ancient words, so true. Changing me and changing you. Uh, that's what the Word of God's all about. And we're going to look at that more this evening. But let's start with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we are here um, to worship you, to learn about you from your Word, and really just to see how you've supplied the Scriptures for us. That it is, even though written over 2,000 years ago, it is still for us today and very relevant for our lives. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, so, we are continuing our series here on Sunday nights called What We Believe. Uh, a detailed review of the doctrinal statement of High Point Church. And tonight, uh, we're moving on to the scripture. So, if you have a doctrinal statement in your hands, there, if you didn't get one last week or you need another one, we have some in back. Maybe Greg can get some for somebody if someone holds up their hand if they need one. Um, and then, um, you know, it's the second paragraph is what we're looking at. So kind of while you're finding that and getting situated, uh, I just kind of want to tell a little bit of a story. So this right here is one of my very first Bibles, okay? Other than some kind of really chintzy Roman Catholic Bible my parents bought me when I was real little that I don't think I ever opened my entire life. But this is, this is one of the first ones. It's a small little Bible. It's the New Testament. It includes Psalms and Proverbs. It is so old and so used, it's brittle now. I mean, it, I almost am afraid to even use it because it's just going to fall apart, it feels like. New Living Translation. Yeah. Cut my teeth on the New Living Translation. Yeah. And so a little story about that. When I, after I got saved and... It really kind of took probably a year or two before I started getting super serious and really kind of pouring through Scripture. And I, I just wanted to, I wanted to know all sorts of things. I wanted the breadth of Scripture, and I wanted to know the whole story beginning to end. I think I've read this dozens and dozens of times, if not in, in the hundreds, to be quite honest. I read it everywhere I went. This is before phones and tablets, okay? So instead of having an iPhone in my pocket, I carried this in my pocket. And uh, it was just a Bible, you know? No Facebook, no nothing like that. And I would read it everywhere and uh, shared the gospel a lot using it. In fact, even in the back, I was kind of reminiscing. I even have Romans Road kind of written on the last page back here just because, you know, just what scripture verses do I need when I share the gospel? And in my naivety, I even used uh, Revelation 3.20, if anyone knows the story behind that. Behold, I stand at the door and knock, even though Christ is not asking you for salvation. He's asking you to get serious about your faith. Um, and so, but one day I'm in a Taco Bell with friends in Council Bluffs, and a guy from my church sees me there. He comes up, he starts talking with us. A lot of the guys I'm with are from the church too. And he says, you know, I've been noticing carrying this Bible with you everywhere you go. I'm like, well, yeah, I'm, I'm reading it. I'm, I'm loving it. I'm enjoying it. I'm just pouring through it. I can't get enough of it. And he's like, that's a problem. He's like, you need, that's not the word of God. I'm like, what? He's like, you have to have the King James Bible. <laughs> And, you know, and as I started to find out, a lot of the people in the church I was attending held to that. And you know what I did? I went and I got myself one of those big old thick King James Bibles, leather bound Schofield reference Bible. And, and you know, you know, some of you know those. <laughs> it's like the old preachers have because <laughs> that's what they told me to get. And you know what? I can read the King James today just as easy as I can read the NLT or the ESV or whatever it is today. I, it, there was a lot more work on my part, but I'm it's probably better off for it. I bring that up because there's a lot of misconceptions that evangelicals or Christians have in the United States about the Bible. Um, we have such a rich English uh, translation um, tradition from King James or Geneva Bible. And, you know, you, you go into a bookstore today and there's probably what? I don't know, close to 100 different translations, it feels like, or at least different variances. And we just have, we just take it for granted, and we have a lot of misconceptions about Scripture. And so tonight, part of it's going to be about breaking down those misconceptions, holding to what we believe to be true, and then finally, for the whole purpose of it, the Bible's authoritative in our lives. And that's really what our uh, doctrinal statement gets at. So let's read our doctrinal statement together. If you have that, you can follow along or look on screen. We believe the scriptures of the Old, of the Old and New Testament. Right, I did say read along, didn't I? You caught me there. Yeah, go ahead and read along with me. We believe the scriptures of the Old and New Testament are verbally inspired by God and inerrant in their original writings. We believe the 66 books of the Old Testament and the New Testament are God's complete and sufficient revelation and therefore carry God's authority for total well-being of mankind. Okay. 
That was a little messy. I haven't done that in a while, but it was good. It was good. Remind me of some of the old days in churches, you know, where everyone reads the scripture aloud together or reads the Apostles' Creed or something like that. That was good. And so before we dig into this and start to truly understand what we mean by this and pick it apart, let's, let's ask the question, why do we even have to clarify our position on the scripture, right? I mean, it's the word of God. Shouldn't we just, everyone believes it, right? If you're a Christian, you believe this is God's word. Um, well, not so fast. Um, there's, there's a little bit of history there. First of all, we have to have a clarification position on this because of Roman Catholicism. Okay? So blame it on the Roman Catholics for why we have to have this in our doctrinal statement. Not totally, but that's where it all started. Okay? So, and the reason why is they attack the sufficiency of Scripture with what they believe to hold to be true. In Roman Catholicism, they'll talk about two things. Sacred Scripture and then sacred tradition. And so what they would say is that the apostles and, and some other godly writers passed down the New Testament to us. But they would say that there is stuff that is unwritten the tradition that is passed down from the apostles to the uh, bishops and the bishops to the bishops and then eventually they start using the word called the magisterium and you have the pope and those they're still in power today over in vatican and oftentimes they'll say yes it's passed down from generation the generation never written down okay and so they would call that the tradition or sacred tradition and here here's how it works because uh, for the most part, the Roman Catholics use the same Bible we do. They have a few extra books uh, for the last several centuries, but for the most part, it's, it's the exact same Bible. Um, it's, not, it's not like the Mormon translation of the New Testament, which is slightly different in some spots. It, it's, they could, we could open up and we could, we could read along together with them in a lot of their translations. And sometimes they even use some of the ones we use. But here, here's how it works. A lot of times we'll, we hear a doctrine, we'll hear something that the Roman Catholics believe and we'll say, well, that's not what scripture says. Right? You ever been in that position? Maybe you have a Roman Catholic friend or family member. You're like, well, Scripture doesn't talk about that. Some instances might be something like purgatory. Well, where does the Bible talk about purgatory? You know, and, and here's how they get around that. Okay? This tradition, which is never written down, which is now two, over 2,000 years old, they will say that their tradition is the rest of Scripture, essentially, on the same level of authority. And a lot of times can even trump Scripture. Right? And so it's an issue of authority. And this carried on for a long time, and no one really questioned it, until we get to the time of Martin Luther. Okay? Martin Luther, one of his things he saw, he saw things that, that the Roman Catholic Church was teaching, and they are asking him to teach and preach, and it wasn't in Scripture. And it really kind of worked at him, and he got really upset about it and really nervous about it. And that's when he took his 98 Thesis and nailed it on the door. And one of the things that really kind of ticked him off the most, that really kind of spurred it, was this idea of, of penance. Um, I'm sorry, um, not penance, indulgences, thank you, indulgences. And that was the idea that you could actually pay money to the church, and then what they would do is they'd give you a piece of paper or a pardon for forgiveness of sins. And you could actually buy so many that it would cover the rest of your life, or you could buy people out of purgatory. Uh, and Martin Luther's like, that's not in Scripture. There's something wrong here. There's a disconnect. And, and that's where we come up with the idea where he uses the word sola scriptura. Anyone heard that before? We'll talk more about Sola Scriptura later. But um, to, to basically kind of clarify our position on Scripture, we, it's because of Roman Catholicism. We're, we're differentiating ourselves from them. That's the very first time. That goes back to the 1500s. Then in the 1800s and 1900s, we have the rise of liberalism, which tax, uh, attacks the claims of Scripture, the truthfulness of Scripture. Roman Catholics would say what's in our Bibles is true. I mean, they're not attacking that. Liberalism is, and they will attack things. They deny the supernatural. Um, scripture is essentially reduced to the moralism and feel-good stories. Okay, what, they'll ask, you'll, you'll be reading along, you might go to a, hear a sermon from them, and they'll talk about a story of Jesus, and they'll say, well, this is kind of the moral to the story. Here's your feel-good moment from this, in, in other words. So, so now go do what Jesus did. Be like Jesus. Not be like Jesus as in be sinless and repent of your sin and put your faith and uh, trust in him, but, but just do good. Love others and do things like that. Loving others is a very good, noble thing, but it's, it's not going to save anybody, unfortunately. And so that's the rise of liberalism, and we have that in there. And then the last one, you may never heard before. This is kind of my own twist and take on it. I think actually when we get down the road 50 to 100 years from now, it'll be in history books and theology books, but relativism. Okay? Relativism attacks the role of Scripture in our lives. Uh, relativism basically says there's no absolute truths. Okay? If there's no absolute truths, is Scripture true? 
No. Um, basically, the motto for relativism is whatever you believe to be true is true for you. So basically, what I could do is I could, I could read something from the New Testament, and I say, you know what? I have no idea if this is accurate, my understanding, but this is my truth to me. And then Titus reads the exact same passage, and he reads it that way. He says, well, that's truth to me. And then we go off and do completely two different things as a result of it. But our truth is just whatever we made it out to be. And um, so here's how relativism works a little bit. I talked a little bit about this poll from Legionnaire Ministries last week called the State of Theology. And so here's some answers from their poll that they got back uh, concerning Scripture. So the first one is, the Bible, like all sacred writings, contains helpful accounts of ancient myths, but is not literally true. Um, what, what do you think got the strongest answer on that one? So, and now this is a poll for Christians, mind you. Okay, these are four Christians. They claim to be born again Christians, evangelicals. Which one? Someone shout out an answer. But the highest is not sure. You mean the highest is not sure? Yeah. Okay, so basically we're saying that like all sacred writings, the Bible contains helpful accounts of myths, but isn't really true. We're saying not sure. Okay, let's take a look. 32% strongly disagree. <laughs> Ouch. Only 17% agree strongly. Um, and so it, it's, it's kind of a mixed bag. It's all over the place. Um, Martin Luther's just rolling in his grave if he saw this, I'm sure. Next one. The Bible was written for each person to interpret as they choose. So basically we're saying, do Christians have the ability to interpret the Bible any way they want? What do you think? I think people disagree strongly. You think that's the highest one? Um, nope. 31% agree somewhat. So that would there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, the Bible alone is the written word of God. Surely Christians can get this one, right? Surely, okay? Um, no, not really. I mean, 30% is the highest one. They agree that it's alone is the written word of God, but you still have a lot of really confused individuals out there. Um, the Bible is 100% accurate in all that it teaches, okay? All right, let's take a look. 27% um, only agree it's accurate in all it teaches. Why in the world are they going to church if it's not accurate? That's, that's my question. Um, why would you go week after week and submit yourself to the authority of the Word of God if you don't believe it's 100% accurate? The Bible has the authority to tell us what we must do. Okay? Now, what we must do is kind of an open-ended question, what we must do for salvation, how we must live our lives. You know, there's lots of things we can take it that way. Here's the answer. Still a mixed bag. Uh, only 27% strongly agree with that one. Um, and let's see, how about God is the author of Scripture? If you remember, that one was on that doctrinal quiz I handed out. How many people think, or do you, how many Christians do you think actually believe that God is the author of Scripture? 30%. 30%. Only 28% strongly agree. You're 2% off, Matt. So if I had cookies to hand out, you would get one. Uh, all right, last one here, okay? The Book of Mormon is a revelation from God. Uh, you're honestly just afraid to know the answer to this one at this point. <laughs> yeah, the Book of Mormon is a revelation from God. They actually did the best on this one. 42% um, disagree strongly. So uh, that, that's a good thing. And then 36% not sure. We got some confused individuals. So if you ever wonder why we're going through our doctrinal statement, okay? If our church, to, I, don't, I think our church is actually a little bit ahead of the curve on this, to be quite honest with you. But, but there's a lot of people out there really confused about Scripture. And uh, we should take that as a challenge to us as Christians, because we know Christians outside of High Point, but maybe friends, relatives in the workplace. What are their thoughts on it? You know, go, tomorrow morning, go into your workplace, and you know any Christians, ask them what their thoughts are on this. Just see where they're at from it. Um, so now this is back to our doctrinal statement, and you can kind of see that this kind of really answers a lot of those questions uh, strongly. It says, we believe the scriptures of the Old and New Testament are verbally inspired by God and an errant in all they teach. So those fancy ways of saying we believe the very words of God, are, the, it's, the very words are from God. They are truthful in everything they say, at least in the original writings. We believe there's 66 books, the Old and New Testament, that kind of pushes out the Book of Mormon there. Um, complete and sufficient revelation and therefore carry God's authority for the total well-being of mankind. So otherwise, the authority, it, it tells us what we need to do on a day-to-day -day basis. So. Um, now let's look at some scriptures um, about how maybe we should approach scripture a little bit. 
Psalms 119, 97 through 100. Um, I'm going through these scriptures because they are attached to the doctrinal statement. So it's a good idea for us to know kind of what these scriptures are talking about. And so we start out here and the psalmist says, Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. Okay. How I love your law. Okay. You have to realize here, law for them basically means the first five books of the Old Testament. Um, and so he, the psalmist is saying, I love Genesis. I love Exodus. I love Numbers. I love Leviticus. Okay? Who's, who loves Leviticus in here? And I get a lot of answers. Oh, Titus. Hey, I like Leviticus too. And I love Deuteronomy. And so this is the funny thing. If you look up this word, how it's used other places in Hebrew, it's really kind of funny. You can actually use this very word they use in Hebrew for love to say you love your spouse. Because it can even carry, I mean, it, it's not like Greek. It's not as, as robust and refined as it is, where there's lots of different love words. But it can even carry the idea of a sexual connotation, okay? So you can say, I love my spouse, have a desire for my spouse type thing. I'm not saying this, you know, he has a sexual desire for it, but you just see the strong language used there that he uses of it is all I'm trying to get at. And you kind of see this continues. It is my meditation all the day. So throughout the day, his thoughts are turning back to the Old Testament, turning back to the very words of God, what God penned through Moses in about Adam and Eve and the patriarchs, Abraham, and, and about Moses and about Joshua. And oh, no, Joshua would be one step out of there, my bad. Well, Joshua's in Deuteronomy, no, I'm, I'm right. And, um, and Leviticus, okay, all those weird little funky laws that we look at today and we scratch our heads and say, that's just weird. Um, he is thinking about those things. Okay? For us as, as Christians, can we say that about God's word ourselves? Can we say we love God's word? That it's constantly in our minds throughout the day. Uh, that's a rhetorical question. Don't answer that. Um, but but it's, it's, it sets a high bar for us is what it does. And um, I, think it's, I think it's Psalm 119 really shows us the consideration and that we should have for the Old Testament and the New Testament alike. He continues on, he says, your commandment makes me wiser than my enemies, for it is ever with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation, which he meditates on all the day, back in verse 97. I understand more than the aged, for I keep your precepts. So he's basically saying, because he has this, because he has God's law, he is um, meditating on it, he's thinking about it all the time, which would imply he's probably living it at the same time too. It's, it's made him wiser than any enemies he has. It's made him wiser than those who would say they're very learned and wise individuals. And it's giving him an experience well beyond what he would normally have. Um, so the benefits, he's going on about the benefits of scripture. Uh, continue on, the psalmist says, I hold back my feet from every evil way in order to keep your word. Um, isn't that true? You know, a lot of times the reason why we sin as Christians is because we're not meditating on the word of God. We're forgetful about what it says, or we purposely push it out of our minds. Um, sometimes we, we try to distract ourselves, so we purposely forget about it too. Um, but he says it keeps him from evil ways. Verse 102, I do not turn aside from your rules, for you have taught me. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. That, that's, that's an experiential thing he's getting out there, okay? You know, you ever, it's funny, okay? A lot of you probably have kids. You know the first time you give your kids something sweet? Okay? You're like, mmm, that's good, you know? Whether it be like a cookie or cake or whatever the case is, what do they want more of? They want more sweetness, right? They taste the sweetness of it. They've enjoyed it. They've experienced it, and they want more, right? And, and that's how the psalmist is, is talking about the Word of God. We, there's lots we can learn from the psalmist about the Word. And verse 104, through your precepts, I get understanding. Therefore, I hate every false way, acknowledging that there are lots of imitations of God's Word out there. That, that the psalmist could grab on, worldly philosophies and ideas. But he's realizing, no, I don't want those false ways. He, he wants the precepts. He get, that's where he gets his understanding. He's tasted of it. He loves it. He meditates upon it. And, and that's what we're talking about tonight. When we talk about the scriptures, 
um, this is what we're talking about, exactly what the psalmist speaks about. Um, Jesus, in John 5, 46 to 47, says, For if you believe Moses, which would be the law, which the psalmist just spoke about, you would believe me, for he wrote of me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? Right? Uh, Jesus is basically saying, if you're not going to believe what Moses wrote in the law, you're not going to believe what I said. And that's really what the New Testament's all about, right? It's the words of Jesus, what Jesus did in the Gospels, and then it is the apostles living out what Jesus taught throughout the rest of the New Testament in Acts and in Ephesians and in 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians and Peter and Thessalonians and all the way to Revelation. So now let's look at this in a detailed, let's break down our doctrinal statement. What do we mean by it? Well, we believe the scriptures of the Old and New Testament are verbally inspired by God and inerrant in their original writings. Okay? Verbally inspired. What do we mean by that? How do you understand verbally inspired? Obviously, God didn't physically write the word. No, no. So, yeah. I guess for Peter, the Holy Spirit spoke through the men writing. Yeah. And wrote through them. Yeah, good. Um, so that's ta that's that you're dealing with inspiration there, okay? Verbally would speak to what? The speaking, but the, but the actual words is the key thing. Um, sometimes you'll hear people say, well, I believe the Bible is inspired, just, just the general ideas and the concepts, not the very words. They'll say, because, you know, the words, you know, they're not so much. I mean, if you really want to get t down to it, I think sometimes people believe that because you look at our English Bibles and we have words like a and of. And they're not Greek words, typically. And so, yeah, there, there are words like that. But we're talking about in the original writings, the, the very words are inspired by God. Um, what about inerrant in their original writings? Inerrant is the only place you ever see that word is when you're talking about Scripture. What, what does inerrant mean? Without errors. Without errors, yes. I'm supposed to use a word to define a word, but... <laughs> <laughs> we get what you're saying, yes. <laughs> It makes sense. And so we're saying in the original manuscript. So, what, so when we say that, this is what we mean. There could, there are, I'm just going to be very honest with you, and it might open a can of worms, okay? There are, believe it or not, when this is what happened, the original apostles or the original you know, human writers, they would write down the Word of God. We're saying those are, are verbally inspired and without error, okay? Now, if, you, if John writes the book of Revelation, which is the last book that was written, and then he hands off to his disciple, his good friend, Polycarp. And Polycarp is looking at it, and he's making a copy. Could Polycarp make a copy error? Okay, yeah. Potentially, yes. What we're saying is the, the, the inspiration and the inerrancy only applies to the original writers, the original manuscripts. Now, here's the question. Do we have the original manuscripts today? No. Now, it's possible we might have a small little fragment of Revelation. We don't know. It's, very, it's possible. Nobody really knows. But that's the closest we get. So we're talking a couple words out of the entire Bible. Now, but do you know there are hundreds of thousands of copies that were made throughout history, of handwriting copies. And for the most part, other than some small little errors here and there, like, like the word the moved around or something like that, or or maybe a number here and there moved around, they're, they're for the most part, all say the exact same thing. 99% of it is accurate across all of them. Pretty amazing, isn't it? Now, some people would say, look, that is an act of God keeping that throughout history. I have no doubt, because God superintends everything. He's sovereign over everything. But we're not going to put that in our doctrinal statement. So we're going to recognize it's to the original writings. And, but here's the thing. If I open that up and I said errors and it started making you nervous, I guarantee you, OK? that the Bible you have, unless you have maybe the message or something like that, there are some really weird English Bibles out there that aren't so great, but if you, as long as you have something that is like ESV or King James or New King James or NIV or, or um, New American Standard or the Net Bible or something like that, you can trust the English translation. Okay? You do not need to be second guessing whether something's wrong or not. There's nothing in here that is going to change um, how we view scripture, how we view God, how we view Jesus Christ, how we view salvation, how we uh, view the afterlife, or anything else like that. 
Okay? We can trust it. Um, does it mean, though, that there aren't translation errors out there, too? Because you have to realize someone is taking it from, from Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic to English. And there can be some translation errors out there as well. But you know what? That's why they have reprints, okay? There are some Bibles out there that are worth millions and millions of dollars because they were printed with some errors in them. And if you have one, sell it on eBay and make yourself a nice little fortune. And then build us a church, okay? Uh, um, so at the end of the day, we can trust these. Let's look at some scriptures dealing with this. It'll help flesh this out a little bit. Matthew 5, 17 through 18. Jesus says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. So there's two things to take away from this passage, I think. First of all, the Old Testament is not obsolete. Okay? Sometimes as Christians, we view, we view hey, New Testament, that, that's what I read. I'm not Jewish, I don't read the Old Testament. All scriptures inspired by God. All of it's profitable for us, as we'll look at here in just a moment. But and so don't don't <laughs> neglect the Old Testament. The other thing is this: you have these words iota and not a dot. And so what these are are they're very little. I'm not going to put Hebrew or Greek up there or anything like that for you because most of you it's just you know it's not going to make a difference. And so they're just very little, small little things dealing with the words that completely change the meaning of the word. And so let me show you an example. Jake, I'm going to move, so you might need to move the camera. I'm going to go to the whiteboard. Um, so I picked a word and I had to think about this a little bit. Okay, so here's an English word that we have. Felt. What is felt? Piece of material, right? Okay, that's what it is. Now, huh? Yeah, touch. I suppose it could be in that too. Exactly. Exactly. Your context of your sentence and your paragraph is going to, and right. syntax is all going to determine that. Now, no matter what you do, though, if this is in any sentence, and I do this, it's going to dramatically change the word. Because what do we have now? Yeah, we have a Star Wars character. <laughs> okay, you see, that is, that is what is meant by that, okay? An iota and a dot. There, there are little things like that that dramatically change things. And Jesus is saying, not even a small little thing like that will change, okay? He's saying, we'll pass away from the law. Um, I'll erase that, because for some of you, that'll be a distraction. You'll just think about Star Wars the rest of the evening. <clears throat> and so Jesus, the reason why we have verbally inspired is because Jesus attests that the Old Testament, the very words are inspired, okay? And we can easily transfer it over to the New Testament, as we'll see. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, probably one of the most famous Bible verses of all time when it comes to Scripture. All Scripture. So, so which Scriptures? All. All that are Scripture. Is breathed out, some of your Bibles will say. Uh, some of your Bibles will say inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Okay, so let's be honest about it. I'm, I'm very big about being honest about things, because some people will just make a blanket statement. Okay, all scriptures breathed out by God, so therefore the Old Testament, all the way from Genesis to Revelation, is, is inspired by God. Okay, when Paul wrote this, no revelation, okay? Some of the New Testament hadn't been written yet, okay? We're just being honest with that. You need to know that. And what he really has in mind when he writes this is really just the Old Testament, more than likely. But it, it, that, we'll see how it does transfer over to the New Testament here in a moment. Um, and so everything is, is breathed out. Think of that. I like breathed out better than inspired, okay? Because inspired makes it like, you know, I was, I was just, I, I watched this feel-good story on, from YouTube that somebody shared on Facebook, and I was inspired, right? You ever have those feelings? You know, you see something like that? That's what that, that's the connotation I get from that word. Breathed out implies it came forth from God. So once, somebody once said a better word would be, if you really want to stick with not using breathed out, would be all scripture is expired by God. But then you have, you know, because expired means out of. Well, then you have another problem, because then it's like milk. What do you mean it's expired? It's no good anymore? So breathed out, I think, is, perfect, is the best translation for that the word there. Uh, we'll come back to 2 Timothy later. So 2 Peter 1, 20 through 21 says, Knowing first of all that no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man. 
And so a lot of the Bible is prophecy. It, it's future events, especially the Old Testament and with the prophets. Um, and it's even in De Deuteronomy and, and Exodus. I mean, it's all whole Bible. It just deals with future events, actually. Uh, quite a bit of it. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So the idea is they were carried along. Okay? So there's a human author writing it, and, so, and then the Holy Spirit is guiding them or carrying them along. And there's two illustrations. One um, is, is the age-old one that people use where it's kind of like a boat. And a boat, and when it's out at sea, don't think of like modern day boats with engines and stuff like that. Think boats back then with sails and rows and stuff like that. And the waves just kind of carry it along. And it still has some ideas to kind of direct itself, but for the most part, it is kind of carried along by the waves. Some people say that's a good illustration of it. I think that's really good. Um, the one I generally like to use is I just like to say it's a lot like a dog walker walking dogs. Okay? A professional dog walker probably walks multiple dogs at once. And so that dog walker has a course that they're going in. They're carrying that dogs along. They're guiding them in that direction. And, but all those individual dogs have personalities, right? I, everyone who has dogs in there asks you, what's your personality your dog? You're probably telling me, oh, well, you know, he's really happy and jumpy. He just sleeps all the time and sits there. And, you know, that one's bad. He wets the corner and, you know, all sorts of stuff. They have their personality quirks. And same thing, professional dog walkers walk the dog. You have all the dogs. And the dog walker keeps them in line so that it's a coherent line and they're getting to their path. Scripture is coherent. That's the nice, beautiful thing about it. There's just, there's just oh, these amazing things. You're, in Genesis chapter 2 and 3, you read about the tree of life. And then you get the revelation. And there's a tree of life again all of a sudden. And, it's, and, it's, and it comes full circle. And there's all sorts of things. You see all these prophecies given about Jesus and Israel and all these other things in the Old Testament. And then you see them come full circle in the New Testament. And then you're just... You're just baffled by the fact that there's not just tons of errors. You ever tried to read a set of books written by different authors? Um, I do that every once in a while. There's some theology books that, that they write like that. You know what? They contradict each other all over the place. And they're supposed to be coherent and without error. But this is across almost 1,500 years of human history with different writers. And it has one common author, which is God, the Holy Spirit directing these individuals carrying them along so that their own unique personalities come forth. You can read John, and John is different from Peter, and Peter's different from Paul, and Luke is different from all of them, and Moses is drastically different from all of them, and Jeremiah is different, and Ezekiel is different, and Isaiah is different. Um, and you can even see Paul developing over the years, because he wrote over a period of years, and you start to see some maturity in him, and you can see all sorts of things in his ability to write, and it's truly amazing, yet still it's all God's story, and God is the common author across all of it. So the next thing we look at for great detail here is we believe the 66 books of the Old Testament and the New Testament are God's complete and sufficient revelation. So 27 books in the Old, or I'm sorry, New Testament, which leaves 39 books in the Old Testament. How do we come up with those books? Is that the Council of Nicaea? The book of the canon? Yeah, yep, yeah, that was part of it, yep. And that would, that would be the New Testament only. Okay. So, so here's, some, here's some thoughts on this a little bit. The Old Testament was accepted and affirmed before Jesus was ever born. Israel had just said, this, these are the books. These are our books. Jesus attested to them. He didn't say anything else. He didn't say, hey, guys, this one weird book that was written by so-and-so, uh, why don't you have this in the canon? You don't see anything like that that Jesus did. Um, then in the 27 New Testament books were affirmed and finalized. Uh, it, it was talked about the Council of Nicaea, but it was finalized at the Council of Hippo in 393 and reaffirmed at the Council of Carthage in 397. And the Council of Carthage actually went on multiple years it just took them longer to get their act together and finalize it. And so the church, you know, they had a very detailed way of looking at this. This isn't just, hey, we had a couple guys who are experts on it come together. When they called councils back then, basically it, it's like you get all the pastors of all the churches together. And they're knocking these things. We're like 500 plus pastors. That's a lot of pastors at that time. We probably have 500 pastors in central Iowa today of all different, but back then, 500 pastors across all the Mediterranean, we're talking Africa, we're talking Egypt, we're talking Israel, we're talking uh, modern day Turkey or Constantinople, we're talking Greece, we're talking Spain, we're talking Italy, all coming together and they're all hashing this out. 
And they're saying, and some of them, they're, they're, remember, nothing's all put together. No one has a book like this, okay? There's no nice little binding and, and small little nine-point font and the words of Jesus in red. And there's not even chapter verses or, 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 or even verses or anything like that. And so, you know, some of them have certain books and some of them don't. And some of them believe that books that aren't in there, that aren't in our New Testament, were, were um, inspired. And they should have been. And they would test these things and say, and a lot of the times what happened was, and I'm getting ahead of myself, but... There's, there's two questions here. Yeah, you have, what about the Apocrypha, which is actually a very derogatory term. Um, if you really want to make people mad, use Apocrypha. You should use deuter deuterocanonical books. That's the PC terminology to use. And then what about the Gospel of Thomas or Shepherd of Hermas? And there's lots of other New Testament type, New Testament era writings like that. So first of all, the deuterocanonical books is often referred to, as you probably all know, as the Apocrypha. And uh, there's a lot of different stories, and they were all written uh, between the last book that you have in your Old Testament in this period called the 400 years of silence uh, before basically the birth of Jesus. And so in that 400 years of silence, people would just write things. But, but, it, but the Jewish leaders of the day would even acknowledge that God was silent. There was no scripture being written. And they rejected a lot of these writings. But there is some, you should read two books out of the deuterocanonical books. You, you really do need to read them. I would highly encourage you to. You are missing out if you don't. It's first and second Maccabees. And the reason why is they're not scripture, they're not inspired, but it's history is what they are. And it tells you what happened after Israel comes back to Jerusalem, after their exile, and what's happening almost up to the time where Jesus is born. And you get to hear about Alexander the Great from history, you know, the guy who was 33 years old and conquered the whole known world and how he came in and how he, he walked into the Jew Jerusalem temple and took a pig and slaughtered it. And then the Maccabee family, which was kind of the bigger, one of the bigger families of, in Israel at that time, came and raised an army and they kicked him out or kicked some people out after the fact and, and they wrestled it back. And then you get to hear the story of Hanukkah Okay? Hanukkah is not in the Bible, but it's probably the only Jewish holiday you're really aware of, right? But it's in Maccabees is where you'll find that. And you get some rich history about Israel and Jerusalem and the Jewish people today, and it really kind of builds up to the point when Jesus comes on the scene. And so I would highly recommend you reading it. In fact, in December, I worked through a new Bible reading plan for this year, and I'm, re I'm reading through the whole Bible chronologically using the new English translation, because it's a translation I haven't read. So I read Genesis 1 through 11, I went through Job, I'm back through Genesis, and I'm, work, I'm in Exodus at the moment. When I get to the end of the Old Testament, I'm going to read Maccabees, and then I'm going to walk into the New Testament. So, and because Maccabees will take me a day or two to read. <clears throat> they're not that long of books, and they're just really interesting. What about Gospel of Thomas and Shepherd of Hermas? They're books you hear about a lot of times around Easter and Christmas, where people say, well, these are the real stories of Jesus. If you read these things, they are so crazy and whacked out, you'd be like, no, no one's going to believe these are part of the Bible. It contradicts all over the place. It has weird visions and prophecies in the Shepherd of Hermas. Um, it's just weird stuff. It doesn't, it doesn't even mesh with the rest of Scripture. In fact, it's the stuff that John and Peter and Paul warn you about. Don't read that st you know, stuff. I mean, you can read it, but it's not Scripture. And so we can trust that we have all the right books is kind of the point I'm getting to. Um, the last thing here, and therefore, carrying God's authority for the total well-being of mankind. So I view it this way. Everything up until this point in our doctrinal statement is kind of the credentials of Scripture. Okay? Um, and, then this is, and then this last statement is why it really matters. Because it's the authority, it has authority over our lives. Okay? It's an authority not that, that God has given his word. So to kind of demonstrate this a little bit, the dictionary definition of authority is the power to enforce laws, exact obedience, command, determine, or judge in our lives. So here's my quick little definition, which needs some reworking, but it'll work for our, our means tonight. The scriptures have the authority to tell us how we should live, think, approach God, treat one another, think about oneself, determine right and wrong, who we should marry, how we should vote, what we must do to be saved, and every other facet of human existence to which the scriptures speak to. That's what it means to place yourself under the authority of scripture. That's why if you go back to our doctrinal statement and you read the very first paragraph, when the one I said, remember, isn't really so much part of our doctrinal statement, it's a statement about our doctrinal statement. Anyone remember, what does it say our final authority is? 
Scripture. For all matters of faith and practice, Scripture is our final authority. Which means if, if I don't know what to do in life, this is where I want my answers to come from. If I'm struggling in relationships or sin, this is where I want my answers to come from. If, if, I, if I need to know how to parent, this is where my answers should be coming from. Okay? All sorts of things. It's, it's, it's a book of answers for us, but it's so much more. It, it's, it's the rule by which God has given us so that we can live our lives. Um, let's demonstrate this, because I'm not just pulling this out of thin air. This is, this is something scripture attests to. All scripture in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, okay, is breathed out by God and is profitable, which means it's for our good, our well-being, for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. Um, so before we can move on to verse 17, let's, let's look at those words. Teaching, or some of your Bibles might say doctrine. It's a word that's interchangeable. Doctrine, teaching, one, it's one and the same tells us things we wouldn't know otherwise, okay? So let's demonstrate that a little bit. If we did not have a Bible, what would we not know as human beings? Can you ask that again? If we did not have scripture, so no Bible, okay? So we're Roman Catholics. All we have is tradition handed down from generation to generation, never written down, maybe, I don't know, or whatever the case, no scripture. What would we not know? Why? It's, it's based on scripture, right? That's what we believe. Um, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Okay? Yeah. What else would we not know? We wouldn't have any absolute know it. We wouldn't have anything to absolutely know that this is true. Yeah. No We'd have man's opinion, right? Because what, what do people say about Jesus? What does history tell us about Jesus? He was a good man. May or may not have even existed, some would say. Okay? Um, so it tells us things we wouldn't otherwise know. That's why it's good for t profitable for teaching and doctrine. Reproof. It convicts us of sin. Okay? That should be an easy one. It convicts us of sin. Correction. It doesn't just convict us of sin. It tells us how we should live righteously or correctly. And then for training in righteousness, that means it disciplines us so that it keeps us from needing the reproof and the correction in life. Those are the layman definitions. I come up with those. And so verse 17, but the, and the whole reason for all this is that the man of God may be complete, so not lacking anything, equipped for every good work. Okay? Um, and so the, our authority is scripture. Um, then, if you want to tie it to the New Testament, I forgot to cut this out, you can go and read 2 Peter. And 2 Peter talks about Paul's writings, and he says they're scripture. He says they're hard to understand, because remember, Peter wasn't the smartest of the apostles. They were hard to understand Paul's writings, but he says, obey it, because it's scripture. It's, it's good for you. So here's some other things. Here's, here's some things that we replace the authority of scripture with in our lives. First of all, we replace it with emotions, okay? I'm not saying emotions are bad. What I'm saying is, is that sometimes we take emotion and we elevate it over scripture. So um, some of you may have remembered that I did a whole four part series on LGBTQ issues within the church last fall. And I researched a lot of different churches of how they embrace LGBTQ lifestyles. And the number one thing they always come to is like, well, if you just knew somebody who was gay, lesbian, questioning, transgender, whatever the case is, and you really loved them, you wouldn't say these things. You would say that, of course, um, you know, it's perfectly normal and that God loves them and accepts them and, and that we should embrace it as Christians. See how they appeal to emotion? Whereas anybody who has almost any level of reading can open up the Bible and say, God is not a big fan of, of homosexuality. It doesn't mean he doesn't love those individuals, but, but he calls it sin. And it shouldn't be something that we... Um, embrace and accept. Um, the other thing we put over is reason. Okay, <clears throat> we are so smart, right, in our ability to think through things that reason is we know more than God. Is sometimes is what we say. Um, we have to be very careful with that because in our day and age, in the 21st century, we have all these wonderful marvels and we figured out so many things. 
when really we know nothing. Because if you go look for everything that scientists think they figure out, they have to print a retraction two weeks later. Um, and they have to keep digging. Tradition, okay, we push tradition over scripture sometimes, and we've, we've covered that with Roman Catholicism. Now, I'm not saying tradition is bad, I'm not saying reason is bad, I'm not saying emotion is bad. I'm saying those are all good things, but we put them under the authority of scripture. Are, we th are our emotions in check? What does scripture tell us that we should believe about that? Um, what is, what is our, how should we think about that with reason? Tradition, you know, are our traditions accurate with scripture or have we come up with things and replaced it with scripture? General revelation, uh, which can be the totality of creation. Um, God created it, yes, but his word gets very specific. Um, messages from God and then visions from God. Um, what I mean from that is a lot of times we will grab a hold of things. Anyone ever read Heaven is for Real? Okay, yeah, I've read it too, okay? So a lot of times Christians will grab a hold of that and see, look, this little boy went to heaven and look at all the things he's talking about heaven. This is so awesome. Now we know more about what heaven will be like. What's the one problem? A lot of things he says are, don't line up with what scripture says about heaven. And so, then you, so which, one, which one do we believe? This little boy? I mean, come on, emotionally, this little boy's not going to lie to us, is he? Little boys don't lie, do they, Maverick? <laughs> you see how we can get really messed up with our authority in life? Visions from God. You have a pastor that says, you know, God gave me a vision and he audibly spoke to me and said, I need to do this. I mean, you have a whole church that surrounds around the guy and, and that's what they believe to be their authority. Um, but what does scripture say? Be very careful with people like that. Test prophets and see if what they say actually comes true. So here's some, mis uh, some application. We'll walk through this application real quick and, and it will be done this evening. You have to remember that uh, some misconceptions regarding scripture is sola scriptura, not solo scriptura, okay? Um, sola scriptura is what the reformers talked about. Solo scriptura, though, is, is sometimes where we get confused. Um, the difference is sola scriptura means scripture alone is our final authority. Solo means scripture only is our authority. As Christians, do we have other authorities in our lives besides scripture? Yes, we have government for one, which scripture would tell us is an authority in our lives. Um, we have employers. Um, we have sometimes, you know, spouses um, can be an authority in our lives. Uh, parents can be authorities in our lives. Pastors can be authorities in our lives um, in all sorts of things. Um, it's, so what we're saying is this doesn't mean that scripture is the only authority, but those authorities line up under scripture and scripture tells us how to think through those authorities you see how that works so don't fall into the trap of solo scripture you can fall into all sorts of weird thinkings of that way exegesis versus eisegesis okay those are some big words i know i'm sorry it's late big words exegesis this is this has to do with how you read your bible exegesis means you read it and you're pulling things out of it eisegesis means is you're reading it and you're putting yourself into it. Your own cultural understanding, your own context, your own thoughts, your own emotions, your own everything. And when you do that, you are undermining the authority of scripture, okay? To illustrate this very quickly, um, does anyone know what Jeremiah 29, 11 says in the Bible? Okay, plans to prosper you and yeah, exactly. Really good things, right? Isn't that fantastic? I mean, don't you just get warm fuzzies when you read that? Yeah, I know. So I'm, if that's your life person here, I'm sorry, okay? You can, you can chastise me afterwards. Um, and so a lot of times Christians, they read that and they're like, yes, man, that is so me. I can see myself. I'm just going through a real bad time. And, and Jesus just wants me to prosper me and do good things for me and not harm me. And, and things are going to be really, really good tomorrow or next week or next month. And I just got to get through this time period. What if it's not? What do you do with Christians over in, in Iraq and Iran and other places that, you know, get their heads chopped off? Can they hold the Jeremiah 29 11? They can, if they're reading it in the right context, and they're using exegesis and not eisegesis. Because the, the context is that Jeremiah is writing a letter to the Babylonian exiles. And he's basically telling you, in, in 70 years, this will be true. Okay, here's the problem. 
All the people he's writing to are going to be dead in 70 years. And he's saying, buckle down, get married, settle down, get jobs, multiply, be ready. Because one day in the next generation, God's going to come and he's going to do a mighty work. He's going to take you back to the land. He's going to fulfill all the promises that he's talked about. He hasn't forgotten you. But you, your generation right now, the ones who are carried off, settle down. You're in this for the long haul. But we don't use it that way, do we, when you use Jeremiah? We use it, oh, there's just a season. You'll get through this and everything will be good. That undermines the authority of Scripture when we do that. Could that be true for your lives? Absolutely. But I'd be very weary about telling somebody that because then you're almost making yourself to be a prophet. Um, descriptive versus prescriptive. Acts 2, 42 through 47. A lot of times people go to that and say, Acts 2, 42 through 40, that is what a church should be. Look, everyone's selling all their stuff and giving it to everyone. Look, communism, we need to vote communism, you know, in our country, because look, the church supports it, Jesus supports it. Here's the problem. That's descriptive. Some things in, in, in the Bible, it's just history. It's just there to tell you and move the story along and give you some facts and some ideas. The different, but some things in scripture are prescriptive. And what do I mean by that? Prescriptive, you go to the doctor, you're not feeling well, and you want the doctor to write you a what? Prescription, right? Take, take two of these and call me in the morning, okay? Sometimes the Bible is just descriptive in things, and then sometimes it's prescriptive and tells us what to do. You have to be able to decipher between the two, because if you take everything in the Bible as prescriptive, you're undermining its authority, and you're gonna come up with all sorts of really weird ideas. Um, um, headings, chapters, verses, chapter breaks, and punctuation are not inspired or inerrant because they were all added after the fact, okay? Hundreds of years later. Um, the Bible is not in chronological order, okay? So when you're reading along, don't think that's how things happen. It, it jumps around at times. You can get a chronological Bible. I would suggest it. It's very, it's very enjoyable. Last few things of application, just for you. Get very specific. What does this mean to you today, right now? What do you do in your chair? What do you do when you leave here today, tonight? Read your Bible, understand it, and obey it. Okay? So, some of the things we talked about. Read it, understand it, and obey it. And here's the reason why. Approach your Bible as your anchor to reality. Okay? What I mean by an anchor to reality? It's the thing that grounds you as an individual. You, you are in the world, but you don't have to be of the world, okay? And when we go out into the world, we hear lots of really bad stuff. I mean, philosophies and things that people tell us we need to do. The Bible will anchor us and bring us back to reality, okay? It is our reality check that God has given us. Write down questions as you read, then seek answers, okay? If you don't understand anything, and that's the reason you use for not reading your Bible, that's not a good excuse, okay? You have lots of people in your life, I guarantee, that would love to help you to understand it. Are, are you in a small group? Titus is a small group leader. He'd love to help you understand it. You in a youth group? Tim Wachu would love to help you understand it. You just, somebody who's here for the first time, I would love to help you understand it. Greg would love to help you understand it. I look around, I see lots of people going to help you read it and understand it and answer your questions. Um, we, you know what? I, I guarantee you, okay? Greg and I would both love it. That if when you call us up and say, hey, can we meet? When we got together, you just wanted to ask questions about the Bible. Because the last, I mean, you know, you know, it happens. Sometimes think your life's falling apart and you need advice and biblical counsel. So that's great. But wouldn't it be great to just be reading your Bible and ask questions ahead of time? When you hit that, you're like, yeah, I know what the Word of God says to that. This is not a panic moment. I'm, I got this. I, I'm, I'm holding firm to the Word of God. Read for breadth and read for depth. What I mean is read large chunks. Get to know the scriptures. Get to know the stories inside and out and how things happen and why things and how things are interlinked. And then also read for depth to understand the truths and get the little nuggets of scripture that you can hold on to. And then Bible reading is a discipline. You know what? That's okay. Lots of things in life are a discipline. Okay? And because sometimes when you first start out reading it, it was the case with me, I would read it and I'd be like, this is really hard. Okay, I, who's this Moses guy? Who's, why, why, is, why is Ezekiel telling people to do all these weird things? And why is he doing these weird things? And, and you know, what's going on? And why are they killing this guy on a cross? And, and, you know, why is Paul getting beaten and shipwrecked? Why doesn't he just, you know, check into a Holiday Inn Express and travel on a cruise ship? You know, all sorts of questions. It takes time. But once you start to see the benefits of it, like the psalmist said, remember, once he tasted the sweetness of the honey, he wanted more. He kept going back. 
once you start to get that, you'll want more and you'll want more and you'll want more. And that's it tonight. That's what we believe about the scriptures. In two weeks, Jesus Christ, we're not going to compete with the Super Bowl, okay? We can't compete with the Super Bowl. <laughs> Go watch the Super Bowl. Use it as an opportunity to share the gospel with friends, family members, whatever. Let's close in a word of prayer and we'll be done this evening. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you that you've given us an anchor in our life so that it can be authoritative and, and help us through on a day-to-day -day basis. May we truly experience what the psalmist says. May we love your word, meditate it on day and night. May we taste of its sweetness and desire it and, and see through all the false ideas and philosophies of this world and hold firm to your word that you have given us. We praise you and glorify you in Jesus' name. Amen.